So before giving the floor to our speaker today, please allow me to introduce her to you. Heather Sorella is a full-time teacher at La Salle College in fashion marketing, and she's a PhD candidate in education at Concordia University. When reading the works of John Dewey and his theory of experiential learning, she became convinced of the idea of having students become more active in their learning to provide insight into taking students' experiences and applying their prior knowledge to learn. So that is what she will be sharing with us today in her talk called Experiential Learning, Learning by Doing. Over to you, Heather. Thank you so much, Andy. Welcome everyone. I'm glad to be here today with you on a great topic that's trending right now, but it's been around for a long time. So let me share my screen with you and we can get started. And here we go. So I hope you can see, uh, it, I, the reason I've selected this, um, let's say template is because I believe that when we do experiential learning, we're connecting the dots. And it's very important for us to connect the dots with our students right now. Um, I found this topic, it's been around forever through John Dewey, but the reason I selected this is because all of my research is on adult learning. And one of the things I read is that a lot of adults, when they learn, enjoy to be able to be more hands-on. So I said to myself, why not introduce this to the students? We all have CJEP students who want to be much more interactive now. So I said, let's take this upon ourselves and let's try it. So today, some of the topics we'll be talking about will be what is exactly experiential learning and what type of approach is it? What is John Dewey's theory of experiential learning? What are Cole's learning styles? Who are the individuals learning through experience? And what are, this, what are some general types of activities and how can we be more effective in the classroom? I think this is our question all the time is how can we be more effective and how can we get the students to become more active? So let's go through a little bit of the history and some of the, the different types of styles and the different types of information. So here we go. What is an experiential learning approach? That's a question I asked myself. So I wanted to go find the definition. An experiential learning approach is hands-on and it's a hands-on method in education that emphasizes learning through application, through direct experience, through reflection and application. Experiential learning encourages students to be actively engaged with concepts and ideas in real world settings. I don't know if many of you still take your students on field trips or do role play and projects, or even when they're doing their internships. I think by putting them into a real scenario where they can practice and where they can be with other individuals helps their self-esteem, but also helps them realize how it is to be outside of the traditional classroom. Through these experiences, students gain practical skills deepen their understanding of theoretical concepts and develop critical reflection, problem solving and decision making skills. One of the things I think we all want for our students is to be able to think themselves, right? To be self-regulated, to be able to be more engaged in their own thinking, to get ownership. And this, I believe this approach can really help them take steps towards this. By actively participating in the learning process, Students can apply what they have learned to solve real world problems. So when we think about, you know, John Dewey's theory, I just want to make sure when I did my turnaround. Okay, good. All right. So John Dewey's a classical book, Experience and Education, had a lot of observations on being able to connect life experiences and learning. He had a saying, which I think something that I'm following now, all genuine education comes through experience. And with my research and my work with adult learners, I realized that their life experience helps them learn, but their real life experience has a lot to do with what they've learned when they've been out in the real world. And how do they bring it back into their own experiences as adult learners? So how, th how this does not mean that all experiences are genuine though. They're not always that good or equally educative. You have to think of what we've learned in ourselves, perhaps as adults, and, you know, we learn something and we, you know, our frame of reference gets into motion there and we think, okay, what does this mean? And I'm going to bring it back with me. But sometimes it doesn't work. 
And we have to think about that. So when we're with our students, they might have some experiences and they probably tell you like they tell me that, oh yeah, they've done this and they've done that. But my question to them is, have you done it right or have you done it another way? And I think this is a great way to reinforce this experiential learning because yes, they come in with their ideas and their learned experiences and their, you know, what they think they know, but by applying it and not just by theoretically learning it through a PowerPoint, right? I think sometimes we look at PowerPoints and we say, oh my goodness, there's so many of them. And students tell me that too. I say, what is the first thing you do when you look at a PowerPoint? They say the number of slides. And that really got me concerned and thinking, let's take these slides somewhere else and let's be a little bit more active. And when I say active, it's not getting up out of their seat and uh, just moving around. It's them taking over and them telling me what they want to do. And I'll give you some examples later of some projects I'm doing with them right now. And they're really, really working for them. And they're working for me too. So we have to think about when we say miseducate because we don't want them to miseducate themselves because I see sometimes when I, when I presume that they know from past experiences, maybe where they're working, you know, a lot of the students where I am, they, because it's a private college, a lot of them work. So they'll come back to the class because I ask them all the time, what did you learn out there? What did you see? More like observation. And they come back and they say, I saw this, this, and that. And I, and I ask them, what kind of experiences do you have to talk about? And they bring it back. And I said, are you sure about that? And then they reinterpret it. So even a reinterpretation of what they saw helps a lot for them. Judging whether experience produced learning can be difficult because every experience is a moving force. Its value can be judged only on the grounds of what it moves towards or into. What I've noticed though, I've been doing this with them post COVID because I'm sure a lot of you also have students that sat behind that camera and, and or if they put the camera on and wondered, what am I doing here, right? It was them and the screen. So when they came back to, on campus, it was very difficult to get away from them and the screen. The new screen were their phones, were their laptops, but in the classroom. So I asked them to think of an idea that they would like to do. And they said, let's make something real. So I took them out. We Right now I have a course that we went to the, uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale. We, we went to the Museum of Fine Arts and just to be there. And they were very, they appreciated very much because they were able to get out. So sometimes their experiences are good, but we have to basically relook at their experiences and direct them a little better. All right, a lot of writing here. I'm sorry about this. I just wanted to get all the context in because I know they told me that you're going to be able to have a copy. So I'm, I'm just giving you a little bit of the story behind it. For learning to happen through experience, the experience must exhibit two major principles of continuity and interaction. When I think of continuity, I think of it has to be done over and over, but not the same type of project. The student comes into our class and they know that we as that type of teacher who wants to continue with them and make them more active and make them have ownership and responsibility. This is something that I encourage. So they know when I'm going to be with them, I always tell them I'm going to have an experiment on you gets them a little frightened, but at the same time, they know what I mean, because I want them to be part of something that can bring them a positive experience that provides them with learning, right? We want to make sure that, that these learning experience can be pushed forward into the future and they can learn from their own experiences and bring them into a future that might be more fulfilling for them. The second is interaction and experience is always what, what it is because of transactional taking place between the individual and his environment. So I'm sure some of you right now are saying, hmm, what environment, right? Well, it depends on the environment. You know, if I go back to my uh, example that I brought them a few weeks ago to the Museum of, you know, of Fine Arts, we're not too far from there, so we walked. That was already an experience for them. They asked me, are we going to take the bus? And I said, no. So walking was already the experience, but it wasn't about the walking, right? It was about being able to walk and talk and have a conversation with these students. And to me, that's also experiential learning. So they get to see that 
Yes, we as teachers outside the classroom have a lot to say and are able to integrate what we want them to see. So these were some of the things I had asked them as we took our walk, it was about a 15 minute walk. And I said, what are you expecting to see? And some of them said to me, I've never been to a museum. I'm expecting to see art. So I said, so am I expecting to see art? What do you think we're going to see? So as we kept talking about that, when we got there, we were a little bit more prepared. So it was, it was a great experience. When I asked them the week after, how did you like it? They, the thing they told me, and it was one of those days, you know, where we have slush and freezing rain a few Fridays ago. And they said, you know, I was first a little bit stressed because of the slush and getting wet and this, but at the end of the day, it ended up being great. I was able to be with my friends. I was able to talk to you and the experience was wonderful. And remember, it was on a Friday from three to six. So these were things we, that was, you know, when we schedule things, we don't know what the weather is going to be. So it's important for us to promote learning. That's what we do, right? This is who we are. We have to make sure that the environment is comfortable and safe. I don't know about, about you, but for myself, I've realized since I've gone back on campus, we got back on campus pretty, pretty quickly. You know, we, we wanted that because that's what the students wanted, but we wanted to make it comfortable. We wanted not just to be back into a classroom and back on the board and back with projects. We wanted to start slowly. And I think the students appreciated that, you know, and they did have a little bit of issues coming back when I say like it was a new transition for them, right? But it was good. So we wanted to make sure, and here I have with my adult learning, um, learners past and future experiences are critical in assessing adults to learn from their experiences. So we were able to take in some of the, you know, pre-COVID, during COVID, um, things that they went through and apply them to, you know, a better experience for them. I think they appreciate the better experience now that we're giving them. Okay. So when I go through this, I'm just going to keep the key words here. Learning is a process. And this we all believe, right? Learning is a process. Uh, to improve our learning, especially in higher education, our primary focus is to make students understand what the process means and feedback. I'm a big proponent of feedback because it's important that we get the message. Uh, for myself, I like to not give them too much, just give them enough, and then I'll tell them, let's discuss. The one-on-one -on -one situations that we have together, to me, are the most, most, most fruitful when we give, when I give them feedback. That's one of the things that I've realized that the one-on-one, -on -one, again, is another version of experiential learning. They're actually sitting with the teacher. They're act actually speaking, not getting a paper that has a few words on it, and they're not afraid because they know that we're that I'm there, I'm, I'm trying to help them. All learning is relearning because we have to make sure like that what they've learned, if it's like we said before, miseducation, we have to make them understand their different beliefs and ideas about the topic, right? By integrating new ideas, showing them new ways to do things. I think that's very good. And that's something that I got out of this. Again, like I said, my focus is adult learning. My focus is working with adults, but our students that we have are adults, young adults, right? And they need to understand that the process is learning. It's not only about one and one is two, let's say. They need to understand that it's a slow transition and there's a transfer of knowledge from course to course, and they have to be able to understand this transfer. And I think now, based on what I've I've seen, even when I do a compare and contrast with some of the grades that I had pre-COVID, grades are better because there's more interaction, I could say. And even when it's time for them to do any type of projects or midterms or finals, I also see that they're able to understand. And one of the things I, I tell them, I, I like examples. Provide me with some examples when they're when they're you know writing down their answers and I tell them because if you have great examples of things that you've done it shows that you've learned something and it, it's working it's really really working to understand when they tell me this is an example I'll give you an example and this really works so that's another thing 
that I implement in my classroom. Give me examples. Okay, so they can get some reflection. They can think, they can feel about things. And they're the only people who have gone through it, right? And sometimes it's quite interesting what we see. I'll take it. Again, the process of adapting to the new world, right? Sometimes when we put them in these scenarios, it's a little hard to adapt. Now, remember, I'm from a college that we're more of a technically based college, right? Where we have different types of programs and you need to be hands-on in that type of an environment, right? And I think it's really working because the information that we give them and when we get them ready to go out into the world, they have to be ready. And you'd be surprised when you ask them, uh, are, do you know this, do you know that, like uh, whatever type of soft subject they, they have, it's not always that obvious, right? So we have to think more about the person and what do they need? I know we're like in this competency-based system where we have to think about, you know, who are they as a full person? And I, I believe that with this type of approach, they can figure out who they really are as a full person. I've noticed now, and I'm going to give you an example after when we look at some activities as of how people, and especially these, these students, have started th thinking about their, their role as a student. What is my role as a student? Which is something that I hadn't seen for a very long time. Like, who am I and why am I here? And, and that's very, very important for me. It's about creating knowledge, right? Social knowledge is created and recreated and a personal knowledge of the learner. So it's nice to see them doing these hands-on things and working together. And also out of this comes like peer evaluation. They're evaluating each other saying, well, I would do it this way. I would do it the other way. So this is something that I feel comes out of this type of a learning theory. Uh, we were speaking before we started, and that's, I think, my screen issue, is that an old, like this comes from John Dewey. It even comes before John Dewey, when we can get students, you know, really engaged and, and find ownership, find responsibility and accountability. These are like three factors, I think, if they triangulate, you've got a student that's really ready, right? And we were saying, like, these are old types of theories and all types of uh, application for students, but they're coming back because I think students need to be active and they need to work on how they see themselves in the future and, and gain some type of responsibility. So a small little token here, experiential learning is the process of constructing knowledge that involves a creative tension among the four learning styles that is responsive to conceptual uh, demands. All right, so I when I talk about the conceptual uh, demands and the learning styles, we introduce Cole. So I think he, again, like Dewey, believed that students have to walk through processes. His learning styles are a little bit different, but you have to be able to walk through the process. So I don't know if anybody has any questions now, but we could go uh, forward and, and look at Cole unless you have something. Uh, Heather, there are two questions for now. Um, so the first question is, is experiential learning specific to certain disciplines or does it work in any discipline in any course? Thank you. It, it works actually in any course because everything students learn has some type of application that they have to do through homework, through activities in the classroom, Example, if you have chemistry, you do have to work in the lab, right? It's not just on a PowerPoint. So right there, you've got experiential learning. You've got the student in the lab doing the testing. Does it work? Does it not work? So um, it can be any discipline. We even have it like if you think of phys ed, right? You have to make the students more active. Let them practice. It's like everything else. So it's it's very receptive to every, I think, every, every discipline. You have an activity in your mind right now. I'm sure you're thinking, I think I could have this project. Do it and apply it. And you'll see that every discipline has something that they can show the students. Great, thank you. And a second question. Um, so isn't learning the result of a back and forth between experience and theory? And so what 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 is the role of theory 
in uh, experiential learning? Okay, that's a good question too. When we think about the theory, we could set, we could you know just have our powerpoints. We could engage with them. We could tell them about the theory. At the same time, though, we have to make them apply this theory. I'll give you an example. For a lot of the things that I teach fashion marketing, so a lot of we have to do work on uh, strategies. Actually, I have a course called Strategic Marketing, and there's a lot of theory behind that, especially for those of you that teach in commerce. But I said to myself, how am I going to get them to understand what a marketing strategy is? How do I make an objective? How do I get a goal? How do I find a result? How do I case analysis is another case, uh, another that I do. I'll give you a great one here. If I did case analysis for my, uh, uh, you know, I'm thinking of it in French, the title, uh, we have a case analysis course and it's a very, and it was online and for commerce and for fashion marketing, I gave them some cases many years and it was like, okay, great theory, but they're not applying it, right? All we, we could do for that. What I had them do is I gave them case studies and I'll give you, last semester I gave them Nespresso and I, the other group I gave Lululemon, and I actually had them, we had the course, we had the theory, but then I had them go out and do observational research, right? Primary research and come back. And they found that amazing. Instead of me just sitting there talking about uh, research components, primary, secondary, let's take a look at data collection and all different courses like that. And let's find the problem in this case and what was the cause? Well, they came back with it. And they went to these two different retailers, came back and were so into the projects that they came up with solutions, they came up with alternative solutions. So again, you can teach them the theory, but you have to make them go and see how they can apply this theory. One of the things I learned was that the Nespresso on Crescent Street had a second floor. I never knew that. So they were able to go and see, and they were able themselves to do observations because they were watching the consumers, something that they never did before. So again, the theory, whoops, the theory works well, but we, they just have to be able to apply it. And again, the way the theory is delivered, I think that also has a lot to do with uh, the practice. Thank you. Those are all the questions for now. So feel free to, to move on to, to your next part. Okay. So when we were looking here at some of the principles that Dewey had, and maybe this might answer some of the questions that we were doing. So learning by doing. So do we believe the learning should be an active process where individuals engage with their environment and participate in meaningful experiences? So we talked a little bit about experience. Yes, students come in with their experiences. But I think we can redirect the experience by having them look at it through different eyes, right? Problem solving inquiry. I think, for, especially for my discipline, it's all about problem solving. It's all about making them become, you know, more critically reflective, more critical thinkers. So through this process, learners develop skills such as observation, analysis, and reflection. The you can never you can teach them all you want about primary research. But unless they go and do it themselves through observation, it is such a different result. Here's the question about integrating theory and practice. Dewey advocated that the integration of theory and practice is in education, right? He believed that learning should not be abstract or disconnected from real life content, but should indeed be grounded in practical experience that are relevant and meaningful for the learner. And like I said, the courses that I let them, we have our theory, and they go out, they find their own results, they come in, they find their own answers, their own findings, and they're excited. And that's the most important to me is when they're excited and they tell me, I've heard about this class, how much fun it is. We don't equate sometimes fun with education, but I think if you're positive and you like what you're doing, you'll learn something. And then the last one here is social and collaborative learning. Do we recognize that the importance of social interaction and collaboration in the learning process, right? You, you have to integrate your experiences, but not only your experiences with other people's experiences, along with the new ones you're going to find together. In our college, um, we do a lot of, um, you know, group projects. 
it's the it's part of the philosophy of our school and students sometimes before i started implementing this oh not another group project you know i'm going to do all the work how do we solve that problem well giving everyone some piece of the puzzle right and letting them integrate this and make the full pie will be something that works i think so collaborative activities discussions group projects sharing your perspective challenges um, i've got a which i'll tell you about later my research study that they're doing and students tell me can we just discuss can we just look at some can we talk about someone else's topic for sure so what we do is we we come up like every student will give me their research topic and the other students will sit around and ask them questions and it's incredible how much they learn from each other and i think that that helps so much we don't have to be looking at it only on a powerpoint they become i'm not going to say they become the powerpoint but they become the source of information and the comments that they give to each other they're interested in each other's work they're providing uh, help to their to their friends and their colleagues all of a sudden we have you know peer evaluation amongst each other and they don't even see it that way they just see it as uh, feedback okay so here's cold's learning style okay so the model here it consists of four elements concrete experiences reflective observation abstract conceptualization and active experimentation so by integrating all of these four it, you know, like I think some of you might, it, it is not a perfect scenario. It, yes, I'm, I'm telling you what it is. It's also how the student gets engaged in it, right? First thing that I do is I can't jump into reflexive observation without having them have some kind of experience. We might think, oh, well, they're young. They're, our students are 18 to 25. That's the, the age group of our traditional student at our college. And do they really want to do it? And this is something that when I look at Kolb and when I, you know, I did all my research before I put this into motion, because I said sometimes maybe some of you realize that too, is sometimes when we become too, we want to put it into work and it doesn't work, what do we do then? You know, it's like we have these students suspended in midair and what are we going to do with them? So what I have, what I start with them is let's discuss what you know. And this is where the transfer of knowledge from another course comes in. And then, you know, we polish it to our own uh, expectations, I could say, and what we want to have to put into our course and our needs in our courses. And that's where I start with them. Let's bring back what we have, the transfer. Let's work on that. And then let's start doing with that and start thinking about it. So again, come into my class. What did you do before? What are your experiences from before? What did you learn a little bit? And how are we going to do something now with that? So we, I watch them, I feel how they feel and see, are they ready now? Because I'm sure I always, I'm, I always get two groups. We have two Anglo groups and I always get both. And we all know that even if you have two groups, you have two different courses, depending on the dynamic in the classroom. So some, I start a little bit earlier because they're very excited about it. And some, it takes a little bit of time, but at the end, if they're be, if they're able to do something, think about it, and come up with their own solutions, that's what works. For me, that's my evaluation grid. Now, if you're gonna talk about evaluation grid, like some people ask me, how do we evaluate reflection? And that's a good question. We know our students. We know when they're engaged and when they're not engaged, right? We know just by the way they speak, they speak differently. They, they like to integrate these things that they've learned. You know, my class is it's expectations and experience. These are the two words that I talk a lot with them about. What is your expectation? And, you know, just asking them what they want really, you know, provides a great environment for them where they can say, you know, I just want to learn this. I, I'm very curious about this. And surprisingly, some of them, you know, I'll get, a, you know, through our Omnibox, right? I'll get a link to something that we spoke about in class, or they'll tell me, no, I went home and I was telling my parents what we did. And I said, that's what I'm looking for, that they can go home and tell somebody what they did. And it, this is what comes out of this, this you know, experiential learning is that they're able to connect with what we're doing. 
So again, thinking, if I look at the keywords here and I'm looking at doing, that's being active, that's my experiment, like I tell them, like they know I'm gonna do an experiment on them, you know, bringing in what they know, what they're learning through this process and be able to, when I think of an abstract, I'm thinking of conceptualization, but I'm also thinking, can they conceptualize? And this is where I see it when I ask them to provide examples, when I give them midterms or final exams or even projects. So this is a really good technique. I think it works and the students are happy and they're working and that's what's good. Um, when we think about it, you have the concrete experience, first stage of the learning cycle, engages in a hands-on experience. It could be anything from a real world simulation or an active activity, let's say. I'm doing, I'm doing, um, uh, they're building a research project. So they have to find their own research topic. So they have to, then we have to, we're at the phase now, right? We're at week seven at my college that we're looking at the interviews for the participants. They've never seen a participant. They've never done an interview. So we're role-playing that. Some of them are really good. And some of them, they need a little bit of polish, like I said. But again, they're getting the hands-on experience. And this is a project that I'm, I'm happy that it's going to work. But they're really getting into it. So this is good. They're very excited to, to interview people. That right now, is they're very excited about that. You know, after the experience, the learner reflects on what happened, considering their thoughts and feelings about the experience. When they did the uh, role play as the interviewee and the interviewer, the interviewer was very, you know, asking the question very directly and the interviewee was saying, hmm, I wouldn't answer your question, you're not saying it properly. But it was quite interesting for them because they were able to take a look at how they're responding, how they asked the questions and how they were able to analyze them later. We're not an analysis yet, but I'm quite interested to see how this is going to work out for us. Here, as, we, as I was saying before, conceptualization is something that we don't often see so quickly and it's so important that they're able to take the theory and be able to speak to you know speak in the class speak to each other in the context of theory right so this is something that i was really surprised about myself and again the active experiments really getting through it but at the same time learning from these experiences not just doing like my our trip to the bibliothèque nationale and our trip to the museum we're not only about going to, you know, to look at art or to get, uh, you know, books out and read on the books. It was the experience of going there. Some of them had never been to a place like that, and they were looking through all the books and everything, speaking to the librarian, which that for me was what the active experiment, like I call it, was. Okay, when we think about our learning spaces, we have to engage students in all of the different types of modes from experience, reflection, thinking, and action. Foster a space that is welcoming and respectful for all perspectives, you know, balance support and challenge because, yeah, it's not easy to do this for the students. They are out of their comfort zone, right? And perhaps it's something that they've never, again, experienced before. Some of them do tell me, yeah, it's, a, it's harder than they had anticipated, but we have to push them a little bit out of that comfort zone, right? We have to get them away from that monitor that they were sitting in front of for two years. We have to be able for us to support them, which is fine, but also we need to know the ones we can push a little harder. And I think sometimes I get, you know, I see them come in on the next class and they say, look, I did this. Okay, good. You know, you did it, but did you want to do it? Or did you feel you were forced to do it? Oh no, I'm, I understand why we have to do it. And some tell me, I don't understand why we have to do it. So that's okay too, right? Create choices so learners oversee their own learning. Well, I get them, I, before we go in, it's not a real flip the classroom, but I always put up some uh, notes and PDFs and PowerPoints or links or whatever on my Omnibox page for their certain classes. And I say that you have, this, you have the choice to read one of them, but you also have to come back into class and tell me what you read. And some of them, you know, have the same topic. Some are, you know, I know some that they're gonna pick them quicker than others, but they get to see and they say, I understand now. I, I had them do, look up two literature articles 
and they didn't even know where to start. But so I showed them we have a doc center and we did that and they were so interested. And then we did some other activities in the classroom when they were working on the research topic. And I was, I was very surprised with some of the results they had. One of the questions I had just made some arbitrary topics and said, okay, uh, eating healthy food makes you uh, smarter. So one that I gave them like 20 minutes to find something. And, and one of the teens, especially one of the students, she said, well, I dug a little deeper. And did you know that not eating healthy at our age can lead to dementia? I said, okay, this must be working because I've never had an answer like this. So to imagine we just had some random topic and the student went deeper and she got you know really involved. So I think the experience was there, the expectation and the theory, you know, the theory behind, you know, like why are the students doing this? How does active learning work? How does it bring on more conceptualization, making them reflect? That's working. The theory itself, when we were looking at like, what can you find in empirical studies? That worked too, because they found that some of the stuff from the past was different. And then we we discussed it a little bit. I put them on boards with markers and all this kind of stuff. So there was a lot of stuff coming out of all this. And you have to allow the time for this. Look, it doesn't happen. You, you might have a semester that it just doesn't work, right? And it takes time because it's something most students have never done before. So again, you, I don't get discouraged. I go back and look back and what did I do right? And what did I do wrong? Because it's the only way for me to move forward and to try it again in another classroom, in another setting, right? So allow the time to do this. And sometimes you might have to repeat it and go over it again, but isn't that learning? It's learning is when we do it over and over and we get better. And I tell that to the students too, that it's going to take time, but it doesn't happen overnight. And here, some of our classroom activities, interactive lectures, group discussion, theory to application, uh, problem solving exercises. I like case studies. I love case studies. And we actually build our own case studies. So these are some of the wonderful things we get out of problem solving, peer teaching. Some of the activities that we mentioned before that they're working together and one is showing another student how to fix it or how to do it better or how to change it a little bit. And also we've got reflective activities. Activities that when the students go home and say, you know, I told my parents we did this. This happens a lot for myself when one of the projects I do in strategic marketing is uh, we take a retailer that is struggling and we uh, deconstruct it and reconstruct it. So as we go through all of the theory, they're walking themselves through it. We had many retailers that they were they are non-existent anymore, but some that are still struggling, they're still in the marketplace. And actually some of them come to the classroom. We invite the ones that are in Montreal to come and see what the students have to suggest. And again, that is an activity you know, the students love these type of projects because they get to see real people, real designers, real production people, real anybody that's in retail. It's not retail is not you as the consumer going to the store or they as the salesperson on the floor, right? They go to head office. We work with these type of companies and the companies love it. They, they want to work with us because it's incredible to see what comes out. So we, we take a look at the first class select some of the uh, retailers that are not working so well and then they have to find out where the problems are they have to find out if maybe the target market is not right they have to find out maybe the store doesn't have enough uh, online presence or e-commerce or something and they deconstruct everything and then they rebuild it and again i think that's one of the best type of courses they have. They, that's another course they really love because there's no um, simulation. It's all about working with an actual company. And yes, every student that we have here in Montreal reaches out to see if they can speak to someone or have someone come into the classroom just to see what they're doing. And then the college again, because uh, we can reinforce it, you know, we get involved with some of the other retailers that we work with, some of the other companies. And it is an amazing project. 
So I think that sometimes bringing students into these real life scenarios and being able for them to work on these um, activities with real companies uh, really helps their, their learning. So I think it's it's good. Would I have done this maybe 10 years ago? Probably not because I think the students at that time were different than the ones we have now. I think that um, students that are that have suffered through COVID, they are they love these type of you know these type of activities. So um, and then I have my references, and that's it. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing. Right here we go. So hi there, Andy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Heather, for sharing these uh, inspiring practices, but also their theoretical underpinnings and some some great examples. Um, I'm uh, definitely excited to to try some of these approaches in in my own classes. Um, so for now, there aren't any other questions. I'll uh, invite participants if they think of any questions uh, to write them in the Q&A module now. Um, if not, then I just want to draw everybody's attention also uh, to the link to the appreciation survey that I've put in the chat. It will also be sent out to you uh, by email. Uh, next week's webinar will be on the ethical challenges uh, of artificial intelligence. So don't hesitate to sign up. Uh, you have the link there as well. And our new issue of Pedagogy Collegial, which is now also available in English, uh, will be coming out next week. So do keep an eye out on that. Um, I haven't received any other questions. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Heather, again, for your time, for sharing uh, your knowledge, your insights with us. Uh, I will be sending out your PowerPoint. So I trust that uh, if people have any other questions for you, uh, they will be able to, uh, to reach out to you by email. But uh, thank you again for your time today. And thank you, everybody, for uh, attending today's webinar. Have a good day.